Hi, and welcome to X Chronicle. Today we're going to follow on from the last episode in R Squared S and get our software to play back some music. Let's plug in and demo it first. So we're going to look at the WAV file format and how we can get that data out and send it over R Squared S. Henry, roll those titles. Is that it? If you haven't watched the previous episode, then this is recommended, although not essential. So important things first, is it WAV or WAVE? I don't know, and I don't give a monkey smelly fart. It's not really important, is it? In this video, I'll sometimes say WAV, sometimes WAVE. So, well, there you go. I'm inconsistent, what can I say? Time codes are available in the video description for the various parts of the video video if you want to quickly jump to what you want to watch. Moving on, let's see how we can decode a WAV file. Here's the start or what is termed the header part of the file. A WAV file structure follows a format called RIF. No, not that kind of RIF. RIF stands for Resource Interchange File Format and is a generic file container format for storing data in what's termed tagged chunks. And it's primarily used to store multimedia such as sound and video, although it may also be used to store any arbitrary data at all. Don't worry too much about terminology. As you can see at the end of the day, we're just dealing with bytes in a file, nothing more. And it's divided into three sections. The RIF, the format, and the data sections. The byte offset is the position in the file or memory where this part starts. We'll go through this. The RIF ID is stored at offset zero, i.e. right at the start of the file. It is literally the letters R-I-F-F -F, capitalized and takes up four bytes. So the next data starts at offset four. The next important one for us is the format at offset eight. This should contain the letters W-A-V-E -E, if it's a WAV file. When we look at the code, you'll see that we make some checks on these things and reject the file if it's not correct. Moving on to the format section, the ID is four bytes long, but all the first three are used for the letters FMT, lowercase. We then make some other checks. At offset 20, that is decimal 20, we have the format of our WAV file. We're only going to accept uncompressed PCF and reject otherwise. So this should be a one for us. Anything else, it's a no-no. Channels. For our purposes, should only be the numbers one or two, either mono or stereo sound. This is two bytes long, so we could, in theory, have up to 65,535 channels of a particular data type. Sample rate is a rate at which we should play back samples per second. Very important to run at the correct speed. Otherwise, your sound's going to sound weird if it's too fast and maybe weirder if it's too slow. Our next important part for us is the bits per sample. This should only be one of the four bytes shown. And our program will look at this to ensure that it retrieves the correct number of bytes per sample. At the moment, for simplicity, our code will only support just 16-bit data. That's not to say that I won't change this in the future, but just for today's episode, we're going to, going to support 16-bit 16 16 data. The last section should be the largest part of the file as it contains the actual digitized sound. The ID at offset 36 must be the letters DATA data. Data size is the size of the WAV data. And in fact, knowing this, along with the sample rate and bits per sample, we can actually calculate the running time in seconds for this particular sound. And finally, at offset 44, the actual data starts. Now, 
how this is formed would depend on the bits per sample and the channels. If we were mono sound and say 16 bits per sample, then the first two bytes would be the first sample and then the next two, the second sample. However, if there were two channels, i.e. stereo, and the bits per sample was 24, then the first three bytes would be the value for the first left sample, and the next three the value for the right channel first sample, and that will repeat until the end of the data. It's a point to note that if the RIF file is a WAV file, then the data will always start at offset 44, decimal 44. For other types of data, it probably won't do. Let's look at the demo code. I'm not going to go over the things from the previous episode, so some code will be ignored. Okay, these two bars are used for reading the actual sound data. This pointer will point to the actual raw WAV sound data. And this is an index pointer that tells us which byte should be read from this data starting of the zero. This structure is hopefully recognizable, if you've been paying a bit of attention earlier, as it's the RIF header for a WAV file. And the sizes of the data types and their names mirror what we've seen earlier. We will be putting our header data from the file directly in here so that we can access the data easily. And we'll create an object called WAV header based on this structure. Down to the setup. We right away copy that first 44 bytes into our RAV structure object by just simply copying the first 44 bytes into the memory that this structure resides at. This will fill out the structure. Our WAV data is just another file in our sketch folder and you can see it here on this tab. I'll cover how to generate this data later for yourself. But for now, we can see that we have an array called WAV data and that contains this WAV file. If we scroll back up, the include for the file is just there. This routine is not essential, but can be handy when troubleshooting. It prints out the WAV file header to the serial port. I'm not going to go through this as it's not strictly part of playing the WAV sound. You'll find it defined down near the bottom if you want to take a shifties. Before we attempt to play the file, we do a sanity check to see if the data does indeed look like a WAV file. Again, not totally essential if you're very sure of the data that you're supplying, so I won't go through this. If everything looks good, we enter the section to set up the actual WAV file itself. As the sample rate can vary, we need to set it with this function, passing in the value that's in the structure that we filled in earlier, for that memory copy. We set the data pointer to the start of our raw data, which, if you remember, is always at offset 44 for WAV files. How complex is it to play this sound data? Well, here you go. Three actual core statements spread over four lines. All we're doing is going round our loop, stuffing bytes into the R2S routine. The WAV file I've chosen is stereo 16-bit sound, so each sample to send will be four bytes, two bytes per channel, and stereo is two channels. We write to the I squared S, increment the data pointer by four to point to the next data, next sample. We make a check to see if we have write out data. If so, we reset to the beginning. Job done. Now, this works, but it has a couple of issues. Firstly, it can only cope with mono sound and will put absolute garbage if you try anything else. And secondly, it will only manage, it will only cope with 16-bit sound. We could handle all these, but it would add to more complexity in our code and it would hide the simplicity of what we're actually doing here. And I wanted people to see how easy it is in principle to play digitized sound. We will alter it to play mono. That's relatively simple on its own. It just needs to alter our code a little bit. Let's look at how we do this. The loop section has expanded quite a bit. We have an extra couple of variables for handling the data as well. We make a check here to see if the sound is mono or stereo. If stereo, as it was in the previous example, we just come to this simple line where we set this point of variable to the current data to output. And then these three lines here are essentially the same as in the previous example. However, if it's mono, we have a little more work to do. I squared S wants stereo sound. So to have mono, 
we have to output our mono data on both channels that we have to send anyway. We use this extra four byte buffer we created at the start of the loop, as this will be what is actually going to be output to the R squared S interface. The first two bytes will be the left channel and we will fill that with the two bytes of sound data. Remember, two bytes is 16 bits. If you are unfamiliar with memory pointers, then I would recommend doing a quick Google search for some tutorials. But briefly, you can think of this asterisk, asterisk as meaning the contents of. So inside the brackets, we add our offset to the data pointer to get the memory address of the next bit of data. And then we are essentially saying here with the asterisk, give me the content of that memory location. And we're putting that copy of the data in the mono, uh, mono array at location zero. For the right channel, bytes two and three, we just do the same thing, copying the same data. Hence, both channels will play the same sound and it's now in mono. Lastly, we set our point to this mono data so that this can be output in our R squared function here. If you want to try this out on two different samples, we'll find them, you'll find them both on this tab here. One mono and one stereo, and you will set which to play just here. And that's it for the software. I've tried to keep it simple again. The R squared S routine here is capable of being sent much more data at a time than the single samples we're doing as it has buffers mentioned in the last video. However, that is for another day. How do we create our WAV sample data that you saw on the extra tabs? I recommend two pieces of software for this, although others that do a similar job will be fine. The first is the audio editing software, Audacity. The second is the hex editor, Hext, H-X-D. They are both free and without adware or anything and have been around for years. I will leave links in the description below. Get yourself a WAV file from wherever you wish, or even MP3 if you want, but you'll need to convert it. I'm going to do that bit now. So I've loaded up my MP3 file choice, copyright free music, and all I'm going to do is save that. So if I save it in the format we want, we'll just go to export, because this is an MP3, so we need to have it as a WAV. And that's fine, 16-bit PCM, that's our audio we want, it's in stereo. So we'll click save there, click OK. And then if we actually have a look at that on the desktop, look at the size of it. There's the MP3, 3 meg. Here's the WAV version, 33 meg. There is no way we can fit that on our small mag controllers. Even the SP32, which might be able to store you know, a couple of megs on a good, on a good day. We need to get that reduced down. First of all, we've got to reduce how much we're saving. If we did want to have that entire file, then there is a workaround, there is a solution, which I'll come to at the end of the video. So we need to reduce the time that plays for us for a start. So let's just zoom in. And we are going to, first of all, cut out the silence at the beginning. We don't need none of that. And then we're just going to save the first four seconds. And scroll back to the end. And get rid of that. That would save us quite a bit, but it would still be quite humongous. We need to reduce the quality of the sound. Again, there are solutions to this. You want to keep high quality, which I'll come to at the end of the video. But for now, we're going to select a project rate of 1600. I'm going to select all the tracks, then go to tracks, resample at 1600, click OK, and we've resampled at 1600. That's reasonably acceptable. However, as I said, if you want higher quality, there is a solution. So export as well. That's all fine. Click save, replace it, yes. OK. Quick look at the file size now, and 256 kilobyte. Doable. Only four seconds, but doable. If you could cope with just mono sound, you could just do the mono, and that would half that to 128K. So how do we get that data into our program? We'll bring up some software called Hext, and we'll just drag that WAV file into Hext. And you can see that's the actual raw data. You can see it says riff there like it should do. And we've got the wave 
identifier and the FMT format as well. So, go to file, export, let's see. I might want to call it something a little bit more. Appropriate my file.h will do. Save it onto the desktop at the moment. What you want to do is save into your actual folder of where your sketch is. But for now, I'll just quickly save it there. So let's have a look what that looks like. So I'll just drag that in. I can see it's all our data, but in a way that our C compiler can understand it. So I might want to call that whatever you want to. You've seen how I've done it in my program. My file, we do need to put the word const there, which is should ensure the compiler saves it into our program memory rather than just allocate RAM for this file, which we wouldn't want. We've got loads of, you know, a couple of megs on plus program memory. We don't want it into our relatively small RAM. And that's it, that'd be in your actual folder for your sketch. You'd include it as include WAV file .h in this case. And um, when you want to reference that array, you'd use that name WAV file rather than the ones I'd used. And that's it. What have we learned? We've learned that WAV files are stupidly, backbreakingly massive for microcontrollers. And if you want to play along with WAVs at good quality, then you're going to struggle. So in the next episode, We'll look at putting our WAVs on an SD card and reading them from there, where we'll have oodles of storage. Till then, thank you to my patrons. Your support is so very, very much appreciated. Thank you for liking or subscribing. You did do that, didn't you? If not, then go on. Slip a like or a sub on. It's not going to ruin your day. Anything bad happening from now will just be a coincidence. Finally, and very importantly, thank you very much for watching. Especially if you saw it all. Much appreciated. Till next time.